As the entire world is brought to a standstill due to COVID-19, the scientific community has launched a full-blown effort to try and defeat the virus. The use of ventilators has already played a huge role in reducing the death toll of this pandemic. The innovators of the past worked hard to make artificial ventilation as efficient as possible, and we could thank them for the thousands of lives it saves every year. To appreciate how far we've come with mechanical ventilators, this video will look at the history of the machine, from its earliest forms to the ones in use today. A ventilator is any machine that is capable of forcing air into the lungs. To understand the importance of ventilators, we first need to take a look at how breathing works. The lungs are located in the chest cavity, which is bordered by the diaphragm muscle below and connects to the outside world from above via the windpipe. The diaphragm moves downwards when it contracts, which increases the volume of the chest cavity. This reduces the pressure inside the chest to below atmospheric pressure, so air is forced into the lungs from the outside. The lungs then expand, and air is absorbed into the blood via small air sacs. The efficiency of breathing can be affected by diseases which cause damage to the lungs, like fibrosis or pneumonia. Other things that can negatively affect breathing include airway obstruction or any condition that can cause the diaphragm to stop contracting. Once all medical measures of reversing these problems fail, ventilators are often used as a last resort to provide a replacement for breathing and to buy doctors more time to correct the problem. Ventilators primarily work by creating a change in pressure. They've done this historically by two different ways, either by reducing the pressure inside the chest, known as negative pressure ventilation, or by increasing the pressure outside of the lungs, known as positive pressure ventilation. The role of the lungs in breathing was first described by the Greek physician Galen, who found this out from his numerous dissections of animals but it took nearly 1500 years for the principle of artificial ventilation to first be described. Vesalius reported in his influential book that he can keep an animal alive by inserting a tube into its windpipe and then blowing into it. The technique of positive pressure ventilation was first demonstrated to a live audience in 1667 by the well-known English scientist Robert Hooke. After cutting open the chest of a dog, he used a pair of bellows to pump air into its lungs, and observers looked on amaze as the dog remained fully awake. Doctors over the next few hundred years became more aware of the principles of breathing, and a Scottish doctor named John Dalziel invented the first mechanical ventilator in 1838. The ventilator worked by having a patient sit inside an airtight box, with only their head sticking out. The pressure of the box was then reduced by pumping air out of it, which caused air from the outside of the box to be forced into the patient's body. This technique of negative pressure ventilation quickly became popular and was being used in hospitals to treat things ranging from asthma to paralysis. But these tank respirators were extremely claustrophobic and the lack of access to the patient's body was a huge limitation of this device. Some doctors tried to solve this problem by turning the small box into a large operating room that had air being constantly pumped out of it by large pistons. As well as the medical staff being able to enter the room for a door to examine a patient, the large rooms were also able to ventilate multiple people at the same time. But this was a very expensive setup, so was very rarely used. Iron lungs were the negative pressure devices that eventually became common in hospitals worldwide, the first of which were designed in 1876. These iron lungs would go on to play a huge role in medicine, when several polio epidemics start to occur around the world during the early 20th century. Polio is a virus that affects the nerves, and can eventually cause paralysis of the diaphragm. Outbreaks of the virus between 1920 and 1950 resulted in many otherwise healthy people suffering from respiratory failure, and in a similar manner to what we've been seeing in the coronavirus pandemic, Hospital rooms around the world were filled with polio patients being ventilated by these iron lungs. 
but these ventilators were only able to save 20% of patients who developed paralytic polio. The main problem with negative pressure ventilators like the iron lung was that you couldn't accurately measure and control how much air was pumped into a person's body, so it wasn't very specific to a patient's needs. But the 1950s would mark the start of the era that positive pressure ventilators took over intensive care units. Positive pressure ventilators had existed as far back to the beginning of the 20th century, but were rarely used in hospitals. But they were popular in other industries. The Paul motor was a portable device that was placed over the mouth, which was commonly used in emergency situations, such as asphyxia in minors or drowning victims. Positive pressure ventilators had also been used by World War II pilots to help them breathe at high altitudes. But a fascinating event occurred, which caused this form of ventilation to take over intensive care medicine. In 1952, there was an outbreak of polio in Copenhagen, and hospitals were once again overwhelmed with patients that needed ventilation. But a Danish anaesthetic doctor called Bjorn Ibsen had a radical idea that would change respiratory medicine forever. Instead of using iron lungs to treat the patients, he suggested attempting to blow air directly into the lungs through an opening in the windpipe, just like Vesalius and Robert Hooke did hundreds of years ago. The hospital didn't have enough ventilators, so Ibsen had to improvise. A bag was attached onto a tracheostomy tube, and medical students were instructed to force air into the tube by squeezing the bag by hand. They did this for months on end, rotating in six-hour shifts. Amazingly, the death rates of the polio patients dropped from 80% to just under 25% in the hospital, and up to 250 lives were saved by this effort. This event made doctors all over the world to realise the massive potential of positive pressure ventilation and caused the field of intensive care medicine to explode. All ICU ventilators from this point forward delivered positive pressure and they are generally considered to have developed in complexity over four generations, with each generation lasting about a decade. The first generation of ICU ventilators were designed so that a controllable volume of air could be delivered to a patient. This volume could be adjusted for people of different sizes and levels of respiratory failure. They proved to be a success, as intensive care doctors could keep a person alive from months on end by sedating a person and ventilating them through an endotracheal tube. The 1970s saw the second generation of ventilators, these new ventilators were designed with an extra valve attached to it, so that a person can take spontaneous breaths, independently from the ventilator. This feature made it easier to gradually wean patients off the ventilators. The ventilators of this generation were also much safer, as they were fitted with alarms that detected if the breathing rate or the tidal volume became abnormal. The third generation of ICU ventilators came in the 80s, which arguably had the greatest advancement in the technology, as the ventilators of this generation were fitted with small computer processors. With these microprocessors, ventilators were now able to provide positive pressure in a multitude of ways and were capable of adapting its settings to every single breath that a patient takes. This made these ventilators useful for patients suffering from a wide range of diseases that caused a large variety of respiratory issues. The intelligence of these machines also reduced the incidence of lung injury, a common side effect of invasive ventilation. From the third generation to the present day, the technology of ventilators has developed to the point where many non-invasive forms such as CPAP and BiPAP can even be used at home without requiring high levels of training in anaesthesia. These modes are mainly used in scenarios where invasive ventilation would cause more harm than good, like in people that suffer from conditions such as sleep apnea or COPD, both of which have become more common in recent years thanks to obesity and smoking. 
So ventilators have saved countless number of lives ever since they were first developed in the 19th century and still more advancements are yet to come to this technology. Future innovations will likely reduce the side effects and improve the success of weaning the patient of these ventilators. There's currently an ongoing effort to increase the supply of ventilators by making them less expensive to build, which has been a major public health issue during this current pandemic. But I hope this video has made you appreciate just how far we've come to get to where we are today with these breathtaking machines.